Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Excited to be here tonight with you. And as uh, we dive into God's Word, you will see what a, a blessing it is to come together with God's people uh, because of this His work that has brought us together. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to go before Him in prayer and ask His blessing over the study of His Word tonight. So bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are again just so thankful, Lord, that you have brought a people out of this lost and dying world, Lord, to come together, to, to worship you, to seek you. Lord, may we seek the truth of your word tonight, God, so that we may, in our spirits, see how perfect and holy you are, God. Lord, that we see your Son for the perfect builder of his church, the architect of the church, Father and the perfect work He has done in the building of the church, God. And Lord, may it bring praise and glory to Your name and great hope to Your people as we see the future of Your bride, Lord. And again, just to ask Your blessing over Your Word tonight, God, please just get me out of Your way. May Your Word go forth and not return empty as Your Word promises that it will, Lord. And so we ask all of these things in Your precious Son's name. Amen. Amen. And so if you will turn with me, we're going to just continue in this wonderful epistle of the uh, Ephesians, uh, the one that Paul wrote to this small church in um, Ephesus. Uh, we are in chapter 2. We will be uh, beginning in verse 19 and finishing, finishing off chapter 2. And so it starts like this. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. Again, as always, this is the Word of God. This is why we're here tonight, to see our Savior and to see our God in the reading of His Word and the study of it. And here we see the Apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit starting off another sentence, another preposition that considering everything that we've looked at, that we've read, consider those things. Consider so that so then asks us to look back. What is the Apostle, again, inspired by the Holy Spirit asking these saints in Ephesus and asking us tonight to consider. And uh, just thinking back to, not going all the way back to the beginning of the chapter 2, but thinking about what we studied last week, uh, Paul calling these Ephesian saints to remember, to remember what the Lord has called them out of. And we, we saw two points last week, that Paul was calling uh, the Ephesian saints to remember that at one time, they were separated, they were excluded, they were estranged and without God in the world. That They were separate from the people of Israel, uh, they were lost in this dying world uh, with no light, no hope. That There was enmity between them and Israel, uh, they were separate from Christ our Savior. That They were excluded from being a people of God, uh, strangers from God's promises and again without hope. So that's a pretty bleak reminder that Paul was calling these Ephesians to. And I just wanted to make the quick point like I did last week that this is not a reminder to sulk, to be discouraged. It's a reminder to see ourselves for who we truly are and to see our God for who He truly is. And then Paul finished up that section in the letter with saying that that's what we were. Remember what we were, but now remember what we are. Remember that we have been brought near by Jesus Christ. And we saw that in two big points, that we have been united by Christ with the people of God, with the revealed uh, people of God. Remember in the Old Testament, the promises and the covenants and all of those wonderful things were given to the people of Israel, the nation that God chose in His sovereignty. And remember we went back to the book of Deuteronomy when He called the Israelites out of uh, Egypt and He gave them that title of a nation, not because of anything they had done, but because of his sovereign choice, and he gave them the law and the prophets and all of these wonderful things, and and we're being united to those promises because of our Savior, and and in doing that, we're not only reconciled as a church, as as two people groups that were at enmity with one another, but we're reconciled to God. 
that, that as enemies of God, that through Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, He took that wrath that we should have felt. Remember that God didn't just bury that wrath. He didn't just throw it away. Christ bore that wrath because our God is a just God. and He demands that punishments and, and sentences be carried out. And so it couldn't be just abandoned. Christ had to feel that punishment for us as we just sang about. And that Christ established that peace between God and us. And in doing that, the benefit is that there's peace between each other. That ultimately, it only matters about our peace with God. And as we draw near to God, we are going to have peace with one another. And tonight, Paul is saying again, because of that, remembering those things, what's the next step? So then, reminding his people. And tonight, the big thing we're going to look at is Christ building his church out of his people. These people that he has united. These people that he has brought near to his Father. And we are going to look at this wonderful work. And it's the, the premise, the thing I want you to keep in mind, it's not the main point of the text, but it is Christ is the ar architect of His church. And we see that in Matthew 16 uh, through 15, uh, 15 through verse 18. And this is talking to Peter. He's asked Peter and his the disciples, who, do, who does the world say that I am. And you remember their response is, well, some say you're a great prophet, some say you're John the Baptist, and then Christ bearing down on it, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I, I believe you all know this, but just as a point of clarification, Peter, the apostle, is not the rock that Christ is outlining that he's going to build his church on. Uh, we have had people in history that have taken that Peter and, and false religions have set up Peter as some rock that this man, Christ, has given the keys to the kingdom to a man. When the point of this passage that Christ, the Son of the living God, is the rock upon which He is going to build His church. And through your reading of God's Word, you see that in the Gospels, this is the first mention of the church, as we see uh, the word, the ecclesia, the called out ones. Um, this is the first mention of it in the Gospels. And so, our big picture tonight, having the framework of Christ as the architect of His church, that in reading those passages and think, looking at, at just the refresher we just did, that Christ takes those who are aliens and strangers to be His people. And ultimately to Him. He brings them to Him. He transforms them. He brings them into the family of God. Christ then builds them, which we're going to say is sanctification, upon the foundation of His Word. He sanctifies Him by His Word. Spoken by the prophets and the apostles that points to Him. Christ unifies and carefully places them according to His purposes, which ultimately will culminate in a perfect dwelling place for God. And so with Christ being the architect and looking at our section of Scripture tonight, that brings us to our first point, which is the transforming work of Christ. So we see that in verse 19, that Christ, so then describing these saints in Ephesus and us tonight, if you are a believer, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. And so three headings I've put under there are, we were once, again, strangers and aliens. And so for you all, as I'm reading through these things, I want you to be reminded of that, that there was a point in life, and might be in this very room tonight, that you are still a stranger and an alien to God and His people and we saw that again last week, that Paul was reminding these people that remember that at one time you were separate from Christ in Ephesians 12. And what separated us? What was the great divider, the thing that removed us from God, that separated us from all of those promises? And we see that outlined in the book of Isaiah 59. It says your iniquities, and in other words, that's transgression, your sins, have made separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. And we can go all the way back to 
the beginning of Scripture that God has always walked with His people. And we see Him walking with Adam and Adam sinning, choosing his desire over desiring God. And at that moment in time, there was a separation, a spiritual separation um, that Adam has passed on through his generations to us in this room tonight. And we were all separated from God at the time. And just as a reminder from that, you can jot this, I added this to my notes, just as a reminder, what are some of those sins? And think back, If I pray that we are walking and, and walking according to God's Word and seeing these things, and if we see them popping up in our lives, confessing them quickly to the Lord and walking away. But listen intently to these things, and if you are finding yourselves being defined by any of these things, I call you to confess or to repent of this. So listen, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10, through 10, some of you probably have this memorized. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that means those who have sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, the ones that would put anything in their lives before the Lord God, nor adulterers, those, again, that would just look at a man or a woman with lust after their heart, not, not committing the actual physical act, but the act in their mind, nor the effeminate, nor the homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And there are many other things. We could list the Ten Commandments, and if we've broken any of those things, those people that are dead in their trespasses of sin, again, if this chapter started out, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so I can say in a nutshell that those people that are in those sins will die and go to hell when they take their last breath on this earth if they do not see Christ as their Savior. So Christ has transformed us from that. That His work, Christ's transforming work, as we see in this next part, that we've been made from strangers and aliens to fellow citizens. We've been invited in. And so you think about America as a nation, and everyone that is outside of America, if you do not bear the title, I'm using a worldly kingdom here, that if, if a Russian or a European or another European or somebody from an Asian company, or a country or an African country were to come here, they would be strangers and aliens to our ways of life. And so you can take that and look at it through the lens of Scripture, and that's us before we are made citizens of Christ's kingdom. Remember when he came and he started preaching the gospel, it said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we've been, as Christians, been made fellow citizens of that kingdom. Uh, we saw that again last uh, week in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one. So remember, we were separate from the nation of Israel. And we know that that's spiritual Israel just because you have the the race of Israelite, that does not mean you're 100% guaranteed the kingdom of God. We have been united with spiritual Israel. God breaking down the dividing wall, which was the law, we saw that He fulfilled those things, therefore making the two one. And we see in Philippians 3.20, where our citizen is citizenship is located. It's in heaven. That now, there's been a transaction. We're now strangers and aliens here, and our citizenship is in heaven, as we see in Scripture. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so just like worldly, as Americans, if we were to leave this country and go to another one, that does not change our citizenship. Our citizenship says, in a worldly sense, American. And tonight, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your citizenship is not one of flesh or of death. It is one of life and a citizenship in heaven, along with all the other saints. And again, I wanted you to drop this note down, because we have the ones that won't inherit the kingdom of God, the strangers and aliens still. And then we see the next verse in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And such were some of you. And such were some of you that are sitting out here in these chairs tonight. And, and such were, was I. But we were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So this great transforming work of our Savior that here we have outlined what we once were. And because of His work on the cross, we have 
and washed and sanctified and justified because of Him. Again, not our glory, not anything that we've done, but because of Christ. And so that moves us. We're not just strangers. We're not just fellow citizens. That's enough. We're family. We're God's family. The, the, the Lord God Almighty has adopted us into His actual family. What an encouraging thing to think about. You realize why I was so excited to be here with you all tonight. To be with God's family. To share these truths that I've been able to to dive into, to think about, to meditate on, and to bring to your remembrance stuff that you probably already know. But we are God's family. And when was this family thought of? When did God choose to adopt us? Not when we decided. Not when we thought it was time for us to be a part of the family. Think earthly. If somebody walked into your house and said, hey, I'm part of your family now. The audacity that would take. So is the thought process not the same of somebody that says, I chose God, that I marched into his kingdom, and not only his kingdom, but his household, and said, I am now your family member. The pride that that has behind it. When we really start peeling the layers back. And so how offensive that would be to us, and we're sinners, how much more offensive it has to be to a holy and righteous God who makes all the laws and who sets his sovereign choice, as we see in Ephesians chapter 1, 5, he has predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ to himself according, listen to this, to the kind intention of his will, his love and kindness. Not because of what he looked down the corridors of time and saw John Hurd do. He would have looked past me. I know it. I, I'm sure you all could testify to that. So remember that, that a sovereign God looked and chose you before you ever took a breath because he loves and he is kind. And we see that in Romans 8, 16, going through verse 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs. Heirs also, heirs of God. And look who we have been fellow heirs made beside Christ, our Savior, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. So that transforming work, look how far, look at the miraculous power of a sovereign God, where we're strangers and aliens, and now we're His children. Uh, it's, it's an incredible thing to think about. And that moves us to the next point. The foundational work of Christ. So we see this outlined in verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So we break that down. The foundations of the apostles and prophets. And these are the foretellers. These are the messengers of God chosen at this special time in church history to bring the oracles of God to his people. This, These... Uh, Ministries, these offices have now closed. We have the closed canon of Scripture. It is enough. We will talk about that. All of God's Word that we have in front of us is enough to see the foundation that God has founded for His people. And so we see in 2 Peter 1.21, so we have the prophetic Word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as a lamp Shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so today, you will see what is called the New Apostolic Reformation. You will see little self-proclaimed prophets popping up. You will see new apostles of the Lord popping up. You will see these things. And you will see the will of man written all over it. You, you, it. I don't want you to go look at it. I want you to look at God's Word. But if you happen to find it, if it finds you or finds one of your loved ones, you can look at those people's quote-unquote ministries and it has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with the glory of God. It has everything to do with them. They can butter it up. They can 
use the doctrine of demons to deceive and make it look very sweet to a people who don't have discernment founded on the Word of God. But this office has been closed because God, Son, Christ is the final Word. And He has outlined and given us a holy book that has everything we need to know about Him in it. And so we see again, continuing in 2 Peter, now chapter 3. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. And so, for Grace Baptist Church tonight, I want your mind to be stirred up as a way of reminder. That you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the Holy Prophets. Everything contained in the Old Testament. All the way back to Genesis. We don't unhitch from the Old Testament as you have people today saying that the church should. You should remember those words spoken beforehand and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. In church, I can say without one doubt that that is your holy scriptures, that God chose those men to speak to us and to write these things down, but it all comes from the Holy Spirit. And so we see that. That leads us to our next point, that the apostles and the prophets' foundation, it's not their foundation, the foundation is Christ. Christ is the foundation. So we see that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10-11, through 11, according, this is Paul, the apostle, speaking here, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another, built, another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. No one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there should be no confusion. There it is laid out by an apostle that Jesus Christ is the foundation. The terminology used in the, the uh, Ephesians is that foundation is Christ given to the apostles and prophets. They are the one that laid the found, that gave the foundation to us. They were the chosen instruments of God to reveal Christ as the foundation for us. And so... Jesus Christ is the foundation, the cornerstone, and we see that prophesied years and years and years before Paul ever was born. In Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed, which is Christ. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. So again, it's not the apostles and prophets are coming up with this foundation. God, in Christ, laid this foundation. And again, what, what do we do with this foundation? What should the church do with the foundation stone of Christ? For indeed, we see in 1 Corinthians 1.22, For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. And this is the church. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But that is what we preach. That is the foundation. That is why you all are here, I hope. I hope it's not just somewhere to come and hang out with people. That is a blessing and a benefit of the church. But we come together as Christ's bride to make ourselves more holy by His renewing work. We can't do it on our own. But to sit under the hearing and the preaching and the singing so that He may be glorified, so that we can look at ourselves and see what needs to be trimmed away and cut away so that we can be made into an acceptable bride to Him. And that leads me to the next point there, is Christ is the Word. That this foundation is revealed to us in the Word. We see that in the wonderful Gospel of John, that in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And, you know, if you don't know, October 31st is not Halloween. That is not why we think, as a church, should think about that day. It is famously known in the church as Reformation Day, that a monk, an Augustinian monk in Germany in the 1500s, had some issues with the Roman Catholic Church, and decided to make a list of those issues and tack those issues to a church door there in Germany. And we know it, and we commonly attribute that day as the start of the Reformation. There were, God was working 
through all of history. It's not like there was a break in between the first century and the 15th century. God has always been at work. But God, in that time, has reformed his church out of what it had become with the Roman Catholic faith. And in that, <clears throat> there was a phrase, post tenebras lux, is the famous Latin phrase that came out of the Reformation, which means out of darkness, light. And we know that Jesus Christ is that light. And, you know, I wrote this, and I want everybody to pay attention, that if you're distracted tonight, I want you to pay attention to this, because Richard Baxter once famously wrote down in a book, and I've heard Paul Washer use this, that I am a dying man, opening the Word of God to dying people, that one day, every single one of you I'm looking at will draw your last breath. And after that last breath will come a judgment day. And on that judgment day, what Christ has allowed you to do with Him will judge and be different between heaven and hell for you. And so listen to this, because this is important. Our faith is to be founded on a correct understanding of who Jesus Christ is. That understanding can only be founded on the Word of Christ, which is found in the pages of Scripture. Christ has chosen the gospel message as the call that He uses to drag men and women to Himself. The gospel alone. Okay, the gospel alone is what God has ordained to call His saints out of a lost and dying world. It is the good news of Christ that is the foundation for the people of God. So what you think about Jesus Christ, not just a name, not just something you hear from a pulpit on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or on a YouTube page. The man, the little baby that grew up to be a man that was Christ, that was God in flesh. What you think about him has eternal weight. That when you die, what you believe about scripture and about Christ, the man, is what determines your eternal destiny. So, if you do not believe me, let, you, let me point you to what the Bible says about this gospel. In Galatians 1, 6-10, I am amazed, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want you to distort the gospel of Christ. But even we, even I, even him, even you all, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you. Listen, let him be damned. We don't escape that charge. If you all, if you all, if I preach something contrary, a different Jesus Christ than the one that is outlined in the Bible, we are not only endangering those who are preaching it to, to the gates of hell, but we are accursing and calling anathema on ourselves. And he doubles down. And we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. And I say that, and I thought about that, and I thought about you all, because I, my personal testimony is that I sat under the gospel message, and I did nothing with the gospel message. That I did not respond in a way that until God was ready for me, but I heard it, and I did not listen to it. So I call all of you in this room tonight, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, and Him alone, to save you from your sins. You are in danger tonight as we walk out of this church from dying and going to a sinner's hell. And that is why I'm so bold about this. Because it says in Romans, the Apostle again in Romans 1, 16-17, and I pray that I'm as bold as I am in here in the world. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, by the, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And remember, this is not the revealed righteousness of God. 
It's the righteousness of Christ that he imputes to us. That through faith, God puts his righteousness on us and takes our sins on himself. And we see that in the first chapter of Ephesians. That in him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, were sealed in him. That the gospel has to be proclaimed, the true gospel of the Bible, not this prosperity gospel, not this health, wealth gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And again, I don't ever want to put the work on you all or myself. It's not a work of us. It's a grace of God. We saw that last week. For by grace you have been saved through faith. The faith that we have in Christ has been revealed to us. Scripture makes no sense to us until God inspires that faith in us. Not as a result of works so that no one would boast. So we see that Christ is the foundation. The gospel is the foundation of the church. Remember, the church is not these four walls. The church is all of us that believe his bride. And so we see the continuing work. That's his foundation. But he didn't stop there. The gospel of Christ has to continue to go out, right? It, it didn't just stop with you and I. That now we have been called to continue that work, to be co-laborers with Christ in that work. And so we see in verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. And so what a neat word this is. And as I was preparing for this, I thought about a lot of you individually. Like, where do we all fit? Where does God and His wonderful, remember in verse 10, where is workmanship? That He's forming us and making us. And we're, we're miracles of God. Each and every single one of us, we're, we're His workmanship. And He's fitting us together into His bride, His universal bride. We, in a small part, in a local church, yes, we're being fitted into individual ministries in, in this place together. But in the retrospect of all of looking at all of creation, all of His saints, He's forming them and making them and fitting them together. And that word, that phrase, it's three Greek words, so please don't ask me to read all three of them in a row, but it means to be interconnected, to be joined, fit together, to efficiently and effectively function. John, let me add something here. Um, there's things to do in the church or inside these four walls. It's not the leadership or, or, or the elder's job to give you job descriptions and give you things to do. That's not our job. It goes beyond like what you're saying. It's that we're fitted together in this place and outside this place. So when you see a need, not just in the church, outside the church, don't call me and say, hey, uh, so-and-so's over here, and I saw that they didn't have food. We need to get 10 people together. No, you go handle it. That's what it means to be fitted together. So I think people just sit around and go, well, I, pastor hadn't asked me to do anything, or there's no job description, or you know, whatever you see that needs to be done, you see trash on the ground, pick it up. If you've been gifted in such a way, begin to start loving and serving people in that way, and a ministry will begin to develop. We'll take note of it. You know, you're a child of God. So I think a lot of people wait uh, until they get approval somehow, but it's God who's already approved the fitting, the knitting. And, and, and again, we're only in this place about four hours a week out of the 168. So send cards, make phone calls. If somebody needs their grass cut, you go do it. If, if they need their groceries picked up in this body, you know, and then you take care of the church and then the body, and then we can start looking out. Just like in your family and my family, if I don't take care of my family, I can't take care of the church. I can't leave them to go. So you got to take care, make care, make sure that all this is taken care of, and then we go out and we start serving elsewhere. So find your spiritual gift and just start putting it to practice. There's no way I can, you know, we have a list here in our notes of all the different ministries. Well, that's just because people started serving in those ways. And we just added it to the list. And we said, well, who else would want to help out here? In the cooking ministry, in the campus ministry, in the cutting the grass ministry, um, in the communications, and all of these different ministries of the church. But if you've been gifted in a way that we don't have one here, then begin to help a person in that way. Make yourself available. And you'll find out that there's a need and you've, you've 
meant it. And God's going to bless you. So that that was that's a really important point because a lot of folks, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't fit in here because I don't see myself in any of this. Well, wait a minute. What's your spiritual gift? You took it. That's why we did it at the beginning. You joined the church. You took a spiritual gift. Where was your giftedness? Well, what are you doing about it? No, no. What, no, no, what is the pastor doing about it for you? What are you doing? Are you calling people? It doesn't have to be just the deacons that call on people or me. I'm not the master hospital visitor. You know, we all go out. I mean, you just think about it. You do all the, you know, you just start serving where you are. You know, I didn't choose to become a pastor. Nobody said, hey, you do a good job at that. I, I just started doing things. I'd say when nobody else would do it, I'd go do it. And then somebody see that, and then, then you just start expanding. I mean, I was going to go, I was going to law school. I was going to be a lawyer one day. That just, I just, Move that, and I, and so, and the same with you. I mean, you just, I, I mean, you can get on the internet right now and go back to when John was 18 years old. And you see the first time he ever preached in front of people. It was 13 minutes long. <laughs> We're doing <the> wrong <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what happens. It's more than 13 minutes long, but that's what happens. You just read the Puritans. Yeah, <laughs> the Puritans. Will so don't be discouraged. Find it, find it. And I, you know, I tell the youth all the time, don't look for the popular people in the church and try to become friends with them. I said, go try to meet people's needs and come alongside of people uh, that, that don't have anybody. I said, if you, are, if you want to really have an impact, go look for those people that nobody else is with. Go put your arm around them. Ask them, can I sit with you for lunch? Can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? You have so many friends, you won't know what to do with them. But no, we want to be around celebrities. We want to be, we, it makes us feel good if, if important people like us. You know, that's not what the disciples did. That's what Jesus did. Where did they go? He said, not many of us are wise. Not many of us are rich. Not many of us are, have wisdom. We're none of those things. We're, we are the, the dredge of the earth. Go find those people. That's why I came to this church. I didn't want to go to this other church that was highfalutin and everybody went there because it was a country club and it was so, oh, I want to come here and get dirty and cut grass and do stuff. And, and we all should be, we all, we all are doing it. I mean, you know, I'm not saying I'm, we're all doing it. We all should be doing it. So, with all that, that leads into my next point, you know. Not that you needed any help. <laughs> so, talking, another great pastor, Charles Spurgeon says, if I had ever joined a church, or if I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I should have never joined one at all. In the moment that I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it. For it would have not been perfect church after I had become a member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth to us. And is that not true? That in all of this world, in all of the chaos, and all of the sin, and all of the separation from God, we can look to each other. Again, it's not this building. It's the relationship that God and Christ has made and stitched together that we will have forever. And how painful it is when somebody separates from the body of believers. That it, it takes skin. It hurts. But you have to trust the Lord in those situations that He will heal, strengthen you, and you pray for the one that has left the fellowship. And so again, just continuing on with Scripture, supporting us, supporting the points that we're trying to make. Look, we are founded on Scripture. That We see in 1 Peter 2 that you also, Christians are living stones being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. And this is what it's all for. All of those things that I was mentioning, it's great to do those things, but it's for God's glory first. And it has to be done in prayer. Otherwise, I can promise you it will fail. Because we are weak. Every attempt that we have, and even if it becomes earthly successful, what a burden it will become. 
to you if you're not doing it in the strength and the blessing of the Lord. So we're being built up to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable, not to each other. That's a wonderful thing to be viewed in a, a pleasing light between your brothers and sisters. But at the end of the day, it's God, right? And through to God through Christ. And so this is just, I think this is in your notes, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. This is us, the church, for as one body, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For you, or for by one spirit we were all baptized into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one spirit. And so we all have different roles in the church. None of us could function. If we were all eyes, that verse continues, if we were all eyes, the body wouldn't function. If we were all ears or hands and feet, that would be dysfunction. That, that, that doesn't work. And so Christ has given us all different assignments. Not one part of the body is any better than another. Each one should be unto God's glory. Nobody, there's uh, The body as a whole, with all of its individual members, are all gifted. These gifts that God gives everybody and fitted together by Jesus Christ for His glory. Not for ours, for His glory. And so we see that, that we're being fitted together and we're a growing temple. That, that Christ is growing His church and we see that in the Great Commission, that uh, in uh, Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen, that Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." And so the church is not done growing yet. The day that it's done. The day we go home, our work's done, right? There would be no reason for us to be on this earth anymore. But while we are here, we are to be about the Lord's work. And we see that work. We see the Lord has graciously framed it for us to see how that work is done. And it goes forth in Acts 2, uh, there at the end of the chapter in verse 40. And this is it. This is the word going out. This is Peter proclaiming the gospel. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. So I would say there was growth, growth on that day. But the growth wasn't Peter. The growth was the gospel going forth. The seed going out. And the Lord growing that seed. And so, continuing on to... Our next couple of points. The finished work of Christ. And so we see in verse 22. In whom you also are being built up together. Into a dwelling of God in the spirit. So as a final reminder. As Paul bringing again. There weren't chapter headings in this letter. This would have been just a, hand, a free handed letter. But in this section. As we've broken it down in our chapters. It's a final reminder to the Ephesians specifically to this Gentile, for the majority of it, church. You, in whom you, and as Christians today, in whom you, you all that believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, are being built together into a, the point of it, a dwelling of God. And so, as a final reminder, what has Paul laid out in this chapter of Ephesians? What am I trying to call to your remembrance tonight? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Remember that you were at a time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. And then to remember that, but God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, has made us alive together with Christ. And then backing it up and tying in chapter 1. When did all this take place? When were we chosen to be a part of this dwelling of God? In chapter 1, verses 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world that, he, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Before creation, before existence, we were chosen to be this dwelling place. And can I remind you, as I thought back when I have been preparing to read and 
That's why Paul, I believe, started the whole letter off with blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he knew the inspiration the Holy Spirit had given him, what he was about to bring. And so for you all, is that not a reason to bless God? That he's called us before the foundations of the world to be this dwelling of his. And we see this verse tonight and then fast forward and we'll cover this if we ever get there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. <laughs> What is he doing in this work that Christ might present himself to himself, the church, in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless before him? That's going to be us. There's going to be a day when these sinful garments will be taken away and set aside, and we will be that holy and blameless bride, not because of what we've done, but because of regenerating work of His Spirit and the Word. And we're reminded in that that as husbands and wives we're to wash each other in that, right? That, 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 that's what that section of Scripture is talking about. And I wanted to set this point aside, the dwelling of God. And I was preparing this last night, just thinking about meditating and seeking the Lord of what this finished work will one day look like, and thinking of you all and being there together. In Revelation 21, we always want to see what, what's at the end, right? 21 verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And it's a wonderful Thing to think about. There's no tears. There's no crying. There's no pain. But the most wonderful thing that I want to remind you all of in a lost and dying world that can so easily come in and try to strip your joy away, that there will be a day founded on the promise of Scripture that God Himself will dwell among His people. And I can't imagine, I cannot imagine what that's going to be like. Or even a heart, or even my stammering tongue, or even a lost, sinful man saved by grace could ever articulate to you all the wonder of what our Creator, the Lord God Almighty, as defined in Scripture, will be among us. Christ, our King, will be among us. We will be together forever because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins. And as a reminder, if you do not believe in that, if you do not believe in that finished work of Christ, that is not the promise made to you. If you walk out of here and die tonight, you don't have that to look forward to. You have hellfire to look forward to. You have a stinking, rotting place forever separated that no gap can be bridged. Suffering for the punishment of sin, but for the save that God before the foundations of the world has called to himself. <laughs> Please go forth and remind yourself of that. Run to the refuge of God's word. Gird your heart up with that promise that no matter what comes, whether you die at a ripe old age and God decides to tarry and shows you grace in that life, or if we suffer the worst death that a human being could suffer, it is nothing compared to what Christ suffered for us. Remember that. that nobody can take that away from you, because it's an inheritance of fellow heirs, as we have been called, to that promise in Christ. And bringing up Luke's sermon from a couple of weeks ago, thinking on that, can we say with Asaph, in Psalm 73, 28, that as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I believe, and I know with all my heart, we will be saying that on that day, that, we are united with our Savior. The nearness 
of God is our good, not this world but being with our God. So with that, is there any other points or anything to add to that? Anybody has? Well, remember that. Be encouraged by that. Humble yourself under that. Seek the Lord. Look into His Word. And uh, we have great promises as a church to look forward to. And that is our motivation because of the great love. Had for us.